on today's story beat i came across forbidden broadway like a fluky thing i saw an article in time magazine about the production and i had an idea that i wanted to share with them my idea was that the actors would be on stage and suddenly they'd start discovering Nina's all over their body and they were like, you know, they didn't know what to do. I thought it was a brilliant idea, so I sent it to the man that wrote the show, Gerard Alessandrini, and he wrote me back but did not mention my idea. Oh, I sent him some samples of my work along with the letter and to show him that I could maybe help with the costumes if they needed, you know, somebody that could draw like Hirschfeld. So he wrote me back, invited me to come see the show, did not mention my idea and said, we're redoing our ad campaign and we want you to do the poster. This is Story Beat with Steve Cuden, a podcast for the creative mind. Story Beat explores how masters of creativity develop and produce brilliant works that people everywhere love and admire. So join us as we discover how talented creators find success in the worlds of imagination and entertainment. Here now is your host, Steve Cuden. Thanks for joining us on Story Beat. We're coming to you from the Steel City, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. My guest today, Ken Fallon, began his career creating witty pen and ink caricatures for the long-running satirical review Forbidden Broadway. Intended as an homage to the legendary theatrical caricaturist Al Hirschfeld, this concept was so successful that Ken continued to design artwork for the show's phenomenal 30-year run. Ken's instantly recognizable, intricately detailed pen and ink celebrity portraits have been published internationally by such diverse and distinguished publications as the Wall Street Journal, InStyle Magazine, The New Yorker, The Hollywood Reporter, LA Times, Washington Post, Politico, and Barron's. Ken has produced stylish and eye-catching art for major ad campaigns, posters, and specially commissioned corporate gifts for HBO, Showtime, Jazz at Lincoln Center, the Metropolitan Opera Company, American Express, CBS News, Walt Disney Productions, and Microsoft. A TV commercial that animated Ken's drawings for CNBC Squawk Box was nominated for an Emmy Award. Several original Ken Fallon posters are in the permanent poster collection of London's Victoria and Albert Museum. A number of his original pen and ink drawings now hang in the venerable Players Club. As a regular contributor to Playbill.com and BroadwayWorld.com, Ken has chronicled the New York theater scene for over 10 years. Private collectors of Ken's work include Barbara Streisand, Bernadette Peters, Darren Chris, Matthew Broderick, Bradley Cooper, Sarah Paulson, Frank Langella, Sir Patrick Stewart, Warren Buffett, and Sir Cameron McIntosh. For me, this is an exceptionally great joy to welcome to Storybeat an artist I've long admired, the spectacularly talented Ken Fallon. Ken, thanks so much for joining me on the show. Thank you. It's very nice to be here. So let's go back in your history a little bit. When did you first start to draw? How old were you? I've always drawn. I can't even remember a time that I didn't draw because I loved the Sunday comics and I used to copy them and watched cartoons on TV. And I just found that I could copy all these different styles and so forth. And As a cartoon style. A cartoon style. And um, it was just something I did. Like some boys play baseball and I could draw and I didn't even think about it that much. I would just do it and... Uh, Everybody knew that I did, so if they needed a drawing or something, they'd come to me, and I would just, you know, do them. And uh, I enjoyed it. I never thought of it as a career. It just never crossed my mind. I wanted to be in the theater. I wanted to be an actor. So that just wasn't in the uh, the program. Do you feel like you act through your drawings? In a way. In a way. I, I'm very lucky because I, I am associated with the uh, Broadway theater now. Indeed. And get to see just about every show and a lot of people know me a lot of creative people know me and it's it's a nice feeling to go in as an illustrator as opposed to an unknown actor because they they know me and it, and it's very nice so and you treat people respectfully it's not you don't make fun of them or mock them you give them some kind of an edge or some kind of difference or you are a caricaturist right I'm not a cruel caricaturist. There are people, there are artists that do that, and I actually admire them. 
but they're very mean and that's their their uh, angle i'm all i really try to do is to capture the essence of the person in line and shapes and somehow i can pull it off i'm not always sure how i do it <laughs> but i i sit down with a pencil and a piece of paper and i just start i just start i can start with an eye a nose the forehead and i keep working it and within probably five minutes it starts to look like the person in, in my stock. Are you looking for some form of odd characteristic in order to latch onto? I'm looking for a characteristic. It doesn't have to be odd. It doesn't even have to be extreme. Some people have like piercing eyes, uh, flaring nostrils, that type of the way their mouth settles when they're just posing. And uh, I usually go for one of those. And if I can usually get the eyes right, right off the bat, I'm, it's going to be an easy trip for me drawing. All right. So there's a big difference. I, I spent years and years uh, writing animation. So I've dealt with lots of artists over time. And there's a big difference between drawing cartoon characters and drawing the character of a real living person. This is true. When did you think to yourself, I'm actually really good at drawing caricatures of people? Well, I would say in junior high school, I discovered Mad Magazine. Mm-hmm. And they had some really good artists in that magazine and good caricaturists. And again, I was sort of copying the style. And also, uh, there was an issue of Life magazine that came out around the same time. And there was an article on the Hirschfeld. And he, in the article, they showed four caricatures that he drew. I did not know any of the people that he was drawing, but I was fascinated by the style. For one thing, I think there was a, a drawing of Helen Hayes, and it looked like somebody I knew. And <laughs> Gee, I'm going to just try this. I'm just going to, and I started doing that. I started drawing people that I knew. Some of them did not appreciate it, but I was, um, it, it was like a hobby. It was just fascinating. So you have no formal training in doing this? For caricature, no. I did I've gone to art school. I did not graduate. And then I took some special courses at Parsons. I studied cartooning. There was a period that I thought I might be a cartoonist. And I also studied LP covers and book covers. That's how old I am. That's <laughs> how to do it. And then <laughs> you, you, and, you and me both. <laughs> right, right. But you have actually, I know you've designed caricatures and covers for CDs and albums and stuff like that, right? Yes. Yes, I have. So what did you do once you realized that you were good at being a caricaturist? Was there something that you then did to try and become a professional at it, or did it come your way somehow? Well, I put an ad in one of the trade papers in New York to make money. I thought I would do caricatures, and I was charging $35 a drawing. <laughs> I didn't make a fortune, but I was getting work. And then one summer, I was doing summer stock in Connecticut, and they paid very little, and I started drawing all the actors in the company and charging them $5. It was, you know, because they had, didn't have any money, but it was sort of a sideline. And again, that's all it was to me. It was just something to make money, and I continued doing that until uh, I came across Forbidden Broadway. Mm -hmm. Like a fluky thing, I saw an article in Time magazine about the production, and I had an idea that I wanted to share with them. My idea was that the actors would be on stage, and suddenly they'd start discovering Ninas all over their body, and they were like, you know, they didn't know what to do. I thought it was a brilliant idea, so I sent it to the man that wrote the show, Gerard Alessandrini, and he wrote me back but did not mention my idea. Oh, I sent him some samples of my work along with the letter and to show him that I could maybe help with the costumes if they needed, you know, somebody that could draw like Hirschfeld. So he wrote me back, invited me to come see the show, did not mention my idea, and said, we're redoing our ad campaign and we want you to do the poster. And that's how it started. And for those who don't know, because there may be listeners that don't know who Al Hirschfeld was, let's be sure we laud him because he was absolutely spectacular. Yes. Uh, Al Hirschfeld was known as the Line King, L-I-N-E, Line King. And he was the great Broadway caricaturist for, I don't know how many years, 70 years or something like, like that. Close to 80 years, yeah. That's incredible. And so you were already an admirer of his from seeing an article on him. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And I actually saw my first original Hirschfeld at the New York Public Library for the Arts 
they had a big exhibit and that was around the first time I came to New York and I'd never seen an original and I was mesmerized by this. And then the Margot Feiden Gallery, which was on East 10th Street at the time, I used to go in there about once a month and spend like an hour or two just looking at the drawings. They never bothered me. They knew I wasn't going to buy anything, but they knew I wasn't going to steal anything. And at that time, they didn't even have them in plastic sleeves. They were just the actual drawing board was oh, there. And wow. And I'm thumbing through them, and, and it's like they're right there in my face. These With the whiteout on it and everything? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Everything. <laughs> um, and that's what he did. If he made a mistake, he painted over it with white paint. And uh, much later, he learned the trick that we all use now mostly is a razor blade, and we scrape the ink off. It leaves a little bit of a scar, but they, it doesn't pick up in the reproduction. So. And you brought up Nina's. For those who don't know, uh, Hirschfeld was famous for incorporating his daughter Nina's name into the drawings where they were sometimes hidden in a way you couldn't find them, but most of the time you could find them by looking hard. Right. He did that when his daughter was born. He just wanted to announce to his friends and to the world, and he put a little uh, Nina in a circus poster. It was about a, a, a circus, the musical was. And up in the corner, it said, Nina, the Wonder Baby. And that's what started it. And he always says that it was just insane because he had to do it forever. You know, he had to always uh, put that in. And it was very clever, though, actually, because people would study the drawings while they were trying to find the Ninas. Sure. It, it drew people in just to look for the Ninas. <laughs> Right, right. So you, I've been following you for some time on Facebook, and I know from looking at what you say on Facebook that you have an incredible sense of humor and a great wit. And well, thank I, th you. I think that comes through in many, if not most of your drawings. And so I'm wondering, where did that come from? Have you always been a funny person? <laughs> My mother's side of the family, she's from a huge family, like 12 children. And Every one of her brothers and sisters were naturally funny. They were just natural, funny people without even trying. They'd say things and everybody else would be laughing. It was wonderful. And my mother was that way. And um, I think that's where I got it, really. So we that then, when you finally get attached to Gerard Alessandrini and Forbidden Broadway, that is something that's clearly humorous. And yes. is is uh, intentionally designed to be mocking of some somewhat of Broadway, that's, that's and so right. I assume that that made it a little easier for you to incorporate a sense of humor into the drawings. Oh yes, that's what they wanted for the Forbidden Broadway. It's supposed to all be happy and fun because that's what would sell the show. So um, sometimes they let me put a frown on a face if it was somebody that would never be smiling anyway. It would. You wouldn't recognize the drawing if they were smiling. But yes, and it was a lot of fun. Gerard was very particular, and he would come in and change certain things. But I was just starting out. I, I couldn't even be annoyed. I was so excited to be working on these that I you know, was happy to make whatever changes they wanted. Well, obviously, he liked what you were doing because you weren't, you weren't drawing straight, unhumorous pictures. Uh, you were making the show seem to come to life. Well, that's a nice way of putting it, yes. <laughs> well, I think that's exactly what it is, is that you're you're giving a life to the life of the show in something that's inanimate, <laughs> drawing. So where do you get your best ideas? Is it just from having subjects, or do you think about someone that you want to draw because you have a concept about them? Sometimes that happens, but I do enough work that I really don't have the energy or the time to just draw on my own. Every I always say the meter is running the minute I put the pen down. And that's only because it became my my income. And uh, I start with a photograph. I work from photographs. And like I, I do a lot of work for the Wall Street Journal. I've been with them since 1994. And in the beginning, they used to send an errand boy with photos that they pulled from, there was a photo library. And I would do a drawing and I would fax the sketch over to them and then they would make changes if they wanted to and then i would do the finished drawing and they would send another errand person to pick up the drawing and deliver it to the wall street journal and then the original was returned to me like two days later by mail but it all changed with the computer it just suddenly became and and they told me 
the art editor told me, they said, you know, you're going to have to learn how to draw on the computer because we're going to be set up. That's all we're going to use is electronic art. And I thought, I got to go back to art school. <laughs> oh, why? I just couldn't bring myself to do it. And fortunately, the scanner came into being, an affordable scanner, and that changed everything because I could, uh, and I, I started getting work all over the world. I did drawings for the Wall Street Journal in, in Asia, and I did work in uh, Europe, and I could just send them, a, a you know, a, an internet, a scan, and it was instant. And that was the other thing, the time that it took to to get to them. So I have, a, I have mixed feelings about that because the internet also killed print publications. It did indeed. Great deal. And there's very few, there, there are very few places that use illustrators anymore. And now I guess you've heard about that computer that can draw. They have a, a program that draws and AI. And they don't have to pay for that. So I'm sure that that's going to to take over. And fortunately, I'm sort of at the end of my career. I, I enjoyed the wonderful years of, of all of all of it from the, uh, I call myself a dinosaur because I was back, I used to have to go to, I was with the Boston Herald for a while and I would have to go into their office. They had a, a morgue, they called it the photo morgue. And you'd go in and it was this big warehouse of a room with all of these battered uh, file cabinets. And I'd have to pull photos of the people that I was going to be drawing, go back home, do a pencil, bring it back for the editor to look at, to approve, go back home, ink it, and then I had to deliver it. So it was like back and forth and back and forth. And I, I didn't know any better. So it was fun to me. I just, you know, I made it a, a, it was just a fun thing to do. And now you don't have to leave the house. Don't have to leave the house. <laughs> never has to leave the house. I never have to worry about things being misplaced or damaged. So you're saying that when you go to see a show and you, you've been either commissioned or whether you're doing it on your own um, and you're you're doing drawings based on an existing Broadway show or characters yes. in it, that you, Hirschfeld famously used to do little sketches in the dark where he wasn't even looking at the paper. He was making right. sketches just uh, you know, by staring at the stage and sketching on paper. You right. don't do that, right? You look for photos. No, if I tried to do that, it wouldn't look like anything. But he had like a, a visual shorthand. And I've actually seen several of his sketchbooks at Harvard. They have a collection of original Hirschfelds and including his sketchbooks and the little pads that he used to draw in his pocket. And it's really hard to tell what it, any of it is, but it made sense to him. It was mm -hmm. a short he used. So, and then he also used photographs. He uh, he would go see the show, and then they would give him the same thing that I get: production photographs, and 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 draw from that. So I think of the most challenging storytelling, really. And it if you're going to write a novel, you may spend years writing a novel, and that's hard to do. But yeah. I think the most challenging thing to do as a writer is to write a really great short story. And what you're doing is you're telling a story in the shortest form possible, a single panel. Right. Do you think of yourself as a storyteller? I guess in a way, but the story's already there. I guess I'm just sort of showing my version of it with the, um, the drawing. You're making a caricature of the existing story. Correct. which is the character or characters in a show. Right, I'm um, drawing the characters uh, of the show. How many drawings do you think you do in a year? Well, um, I do at least two drawings a week. So if you multiply that by, what is it? A uh, uh, hundred plus, a <laughs> hundred plus. And sometimes more. Some some uh, commissions that I get, mostly uh, corporate or private commissions. I'm I'm working on a drawing now of the movie Dr. Strangelove. And I'm doing this for a person who's a big fan of Dr. Strangelove. And I'm drawing most of the characters in there with the bomb and the whole thing. And that's a lot of fun, but all those, just all those drawings. It's a, a lot of drawings. Yeah, I would think it would be a lot of drawings. There's a lot of characters in that movie. Yes, yes. He just wanted the main ones, but it's fun. And like I was telling you earlier about pricing, I get some drawings that have a lot of detail and then sometimes a single person, just a drawing like that. But I'm I'm sure that it's over a hundred and something drawings a year. Do you think over time that you have gotten better at it, that your facility for it has become better and better over time? 
Absolutely. Absolutely. It's the practice thing. And even learning new techniques, sometimes accidentally. But yes, I, I definitely feel um, I, I, I did an exhibit about 10 years ago in New York, and they wanted to use some of my drawings from the Boston era. And I was a little ashamed of them, but they actually people were admiring them. And I, I saw the nice thing about the art editor at Boston was that they, they let me try anything. And it was that's where I really grew as an artist because I knew I could, you know, try anything. Well, you know, Ken, everybody's got to start somewhere. <laughs> that's true. But um, yes, to answer, absolutely. I feel I'm better this year than I was last year. All right. So let's talk about your actual physical process. How methodical are you? Does every drawing begin to take shape in the same way or do you do each drawing as a unique experience? Basically the same. For the drawings that I do for the theater, I actually just take a piece of scrap paper and do uh, circles for heads to place them to know where they're going to be placed. And then I, I use illustration board and I do a pencil drawing of the whole thing. And once I'm happy with that, I ink it. I go over with a quill pen, the one you dip in the ink. Really? Hirschfeld did, but I started doing it and I... I can't not do it that way because I've tried mechanical pens and I've even I've even tried drawing on the computer. It's just not the same. What is it about the quill pen that makes it so wonderful? It's actually very easy for to control it once you've learned how to do it and you feel it. You you stick the thing in it and it's a very sharp pen and you're scraping it across the, the board. You feel the drawing and whatever uh, textures or whatever you, you're doing, you're 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 touching it, you're feeling it. And uh, that means a lot to me. I, I really enjoy that. So how much roughing in do you do prior to inking? It varies, but I, I do the finished drawing in pencil. And uh, Stanley, my husband, has said to me, I think some of your pencils are better than the ink because it's spontaneous <laughs> and everything. But I do it all. I mean, if, the, if there's a pattern or anything, I have to do that in pencil first to see how it's going to balance do, do you then look at things and make changes and erase and what do you do you actually use an eraser what do you do oh yes yes i have uh, two different types i have the um the gum eraser the one that you stretch and pull it's like putty i use that and then i have a very strong uh white eraser that really does a good job and i i wait until the ink is dry and then i get rid of all of the um the pencil marks and still don't get all of them sometimes and, by the work they actually like that if they see there's a pencil like stanley i am a big fan of drawings that are loose and sort of look like they're they're rough uh, i i like those too as well as i like finished pieces as well so right. i understand right. his thought process on that and maybe someday you'll do a show where it's just your roughs <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes oh boy <laughs> <laughs> I have to tell you a quick story. Sure. When I was doing the cartoons this was about 40 years ago, I was hired by this man who owned a publishing company, but he was retired and he lived in a penthouse in the village and he was uh, assembling a joke book and he was looking for somebody to illustrate this book. So I went there were a whole bunch of artists. We went down and he chose me and I did all of these drawings but I would do roughs and, and mail them to him. And so when the book came out, he published the roughs and not the finished drawings. Oh. I would say, ah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was an accident. I don't think it was on purpose. But So your medium is paper and ink, pencil, paper, ink, correct? Correct. And correct. do you work in other mediums as well? And you say you work in the computer a little bit. What do you do in the computer? Well, there was a, I don't know how long ago, the Wall Street Journal was always black and white. Right. And then when Murdoch bought it, they decided to go color. And that was not my strong suit, but I figured, you know, I'm going to do it anyway. And so I did. I had fun. I was using uh, watercolor, wash, colored pencils, and I really enjoyed it, but it took a lot of time. And a friend of mine that works at Disney said, well, you've got to get Photoshop. There's, you know, and I thought, uh, again, a mechanical thing. It's because I like having the original. So there will be no color original because you do it on Photoshop and then it comes out, you know, in the scan and so forth. But it saves so much time 
and it you don't spill anything or you know mess it up you can correct everything and you've got this drawing so i mean i am a photoshop devotee now i i am too i love photoshop and i think it's uh you know it is different than actually putting some form of paint or ink to yes. to a paper but at the same time it does it is a lot it doesn't have a smell to it it's uh, <laughs> nice and neat and clean i think that's what i like about it do you do other kinds of art in your life as well do you ever paint just to, for giggles and grins or not no the last time i did that i was in art school and it was fun but it just wasn't me and um no and if i were younger and had more energy i guess i would be doing more drawings just for myself during covid I did about 20 drawings just like that, just people that I admired, artists and so forth, not art of uh, characters and movies. And, and But then I'm planning to put those in an exhibit because it's very hard for me to do something and just put it away somewhere and not share it. And those were just for you. They weren't for hire. Right. I just did them to something to do during COVID. And, uh, and I did some really nice drawings. So I'm going to, I have, I'm planning, hoping to have an exhibit in the summer at the same place where I'm, my work is now at New World Stages. They have a gigantic lobby. And 12 years ago, they gave me a show and they had a gallery. And after my show, they decided to get rid of the gallery. And they asked me if I wanted a permanent exhibit. So what I've done over the years, that was like 12 years ago, is I replace certain things. So it's constantly changing. But that's my uh, permanent exhibit. And I've sold a lot of work from there. It's been good. Well, that is good. Uh, one of the hallmarks I note about your work is that it has emotion to it. It's not plain. It has some form of feeling in it. Okay. Do you seek that out? Is that something you think about? Not really. I think I'm just looking at the photograph. If the person has a certain expression, I try to put that into the drawing. I enjoy drawing frowning people more than smiling <laughs> people, but that doesn't always work in certain particular um, drawings. So I have to do the smile because frowning, when you frown, your face just takes on a whole other dimension. Do you ever get complaints from anyone because you've drawn them frowning or in some way they don't like? Well, I've, I've had complaints. It's usually, it doesn't look like me, but I sell a lot of my Wall Street Journal drawings because I do CEOs and all these business people and so forth. And I've had people actually buy the original and they say, well, it doesn't look like me, but it was in the Wall Street Journal. So, you know, but that doesn't happen very often. I'm, I'm truly curious about this. You own your own work? You own your own copyright? Yes. I forget the, the uh, Graphic Artists Guild went after the publications and said, you know, this cannot be a work for hire situation because you're you're taking the work and you can use it over and over and over again. And uh, Mad Magazine was one of the worst, actually. They, they took such advantage of their artists, but the artists wanted to work for them. And they made these laws now, these rules. The artist owns the work, and after one reproduction, say it runs in the Wall Street Journal once, they have to pay me if they run it again. Or if somebody wants to buy the article and print it like in a company magazine, they contact they have they have to call me and pay me something. So that's why I'm not starving. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would say you're also prolific, so that would help you not starve if you're selling it. <laughs> so yes, yes. <laughs> thin fingers. <laughs> so about how long does it typically take you to complete a drawing from concept to completion? Well, when I started with the journal, they had a thing where they would contact you by 11 in the morning, and they wanted the finished drawing by 5 o'clock the latest that day. Wow. I learned to draw very quickly and to ink quick. And it was exciting because that clock is ticking. And under pressure, I work very well under pressure and deadlines. If you don't give me a deadline, I get very lazy, and I keep putting the project over. But I have now the Wall Street Journal contacts me on Tuesday and they don't need the drawing, finish drawing till Friday. So that's really changed a lot. But I try to finish it as quickly as I can. You don't then wait till the last minute to give you that pressure. You actually try to get out in front of it, right? I, I sleep better when I know that I've finished it because they have to approve it. Not only is it getting, but you have to show them the pencil and they have to like it. But fortunately, 
I've been there so long and the art editors know my work. And so if there's any change, it's usually in the, a prop or something or a background thing. I almost, I say 95%, the drawing of the face gets approved right away. And because um, they know, they almost know what it's going to look like before I send it to them. What are the biggest challenges in your world? Is it conceiving of the picture? Is it the selling of the picture? Is it the the actual physical drawing? What what would you say are the biggest things that you deal with on a regular basis that your challenges you must overcome regularly? Well, I'll tell you a secret. I am nervous with every drawing in the beginning because like I told you earlier, I'm not really sure how I pull it off. And so I, I put it on paper and I'm thinking, because I know what the person looks like from the photograph, but I show it to Stanley or to my dog, Alfie. And if they, you know, they say, oh yeah, that's good. That's good. So my, that's actually the biggest um, thing is worrying that it's going to be good and accepted. And it's always that way. It's been that way. Um, I had a gigantic ad campaign in 1994 for American Express, and it was more money than I could even dream about. And I was all of my drawings had to be approved by the art directors, by the uh, advertiser, American Express, and the person that I was drawing. So I just went in because it was so much money. I thought, I don't care. I'm going to do this. And it got to the point that, that I wasn't really that nervous when I started doing those drawings. And how does Alfie approve or disapprove? Well, he loves me so much. He always gives me an approval <laughs> to admit that he just, you know, licks me or whatever. He's actually right here right now next. He's always <laughs> next to me. And my drawing table, he has a bed next to it. So he's, he's uh, there. You now have a picture in front of you of a, of a character or a subject. And I already asked you once, are you looking for some discernible thing? But are you trying to capture an essence of that person? You're, you're not making a, a photorealistic drawing of that person. It's a caricature. I, I've tried to do that sometimes out of frustration, and I'm not getting it as a caricature. I'll start trying to draw it as a realistic drawing, and it always ends up as a caricature. It's like <laughs> a trick thing. Like brain, it, and then it, come, it works out that way. So uh, When you're drawing, do you think about the audience? Or are you only looking to please yourself at first? I think I'm only doing it to please myself. So you're not worried about the audience or how they're going to react. I know you want them to be happy with it and to right. approve. Right. But you're not thinking about, oh, this audience wants this kind of a drawing. Or do you think about that? Does American Express want one sort of thing versus uh, HBO wants a different sort of thing? Well, not really, because they're hiring me for the style. And most illustrators now just use do one style because it's much easier to get work that way. So they know that they want it in that style. That's also you, obviously, because when I see your work, I know it's your work. Oh, thank you. It's distinctive. Either, well, it's, it is. That's not, I don't think that that's a, a strange thing to say in your case. It is absolutely, it, it's your work. Just like when I see a Hirschfeld, I know it's a Hirschfeld. And when I see Picasso, usually I know it's a Picasso. You know, it's that sort of thing. Yeah. You have a distinctive style. Did you develop that style? Did you think about your voice as you did this over time? Or did it, is it just always been there? Well, basically it was there. And I always drew in that Hirschfeld style. And then when I, when I did the Forbidden Broadway work, that's when I started getting commercial art or commissions from uh, design studios and advertising agencies. And it was developed. I tried it now for many years not to have it look like Hirschfeld, just more my, my own. And uh, his widow, who's a, actually a friend of mine, has said that I've succeeded, that I've made the drawings, you know, my own. I think, I think she's absolutely right. Thank you. I think they are 100% you. And like I say, when I see... I see your work float across Facebook and other places. I see it on playbill.com and so on. When I see it float across, I, I say, oh, that's a Ken Fallon drawing. I, I know it instantly. It's not, it's, it doesn't require any real deep thought to determine who, who drew it. What would you say is the easiest assignment you've ever had that just came to you in a flash and you were done so quickly? Carol Channing. Carol Channing. 
Well, for Forbidden Broadway, her character was not in the original production. And her husband actually went to Gerard and said, you should put Carol in. And I did these drawings of her and she loved them. As a matter of fact, she, she came to Boston when I was living there and I was invited to go backstage before the show and meet her. And uh, she was great. And she was so complimentary and really studied the, the drawings, but she was, I'd always loved her, but drawing her was so easy because of her features. And you could, you know, and I watched her put on her lipstick and she just took her hand and smeared it across her face. And that was it. It was like a caricature. Really. She she actually put her lipstick on by smearing it across her face? Yeah, she had two fingers, and she just went top and bottom. Then she kind of kneaded it up a little bit. It was amazing. Done it a thousand million times. So. And maybe maybe a dozen times a day sometimes. Right. But she is a caricature. There are people that, there are not that many left, but there are people that are caricatures. And uh, I think of them as Muppets. <laughs> really? The the people in the world? Well, or... well, I think that I think there are certain people in the world that are living caricatures. They're living, yes. they're kind of have a Muppet like look to them and yes. they bop around in the world a little bit like puppets. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they, those people do exist. And especially in the theater where there people are uh, producers, I think, are always looking for someone who is distinct in the way they look. Yes. I think so. Unless they're in the chorus, and then you kind of want them to all blend right. together, right? Blend together, yes, absolutely. But so, the politicians, because uh, I do a lot of politicians for the journal, and um, a certain president, ex-president that we have was a caricature to me. But I, the journal is conservative, so I was always worried that I was going to go too far doing politicians. So I, I toned everything down. But I had fun with that certain president, and uh, he was just a godsend. Because you, even if you tried to do it mild, it still came out an exaggeration. And did you ever get any complaints from that camp? No. And what's interesting, before this person was elected president, I was hired to do a uh, ad for CNBC. And it was for this program they have called um, Squawk Box. Thank you. And it was I had to draw the three people that were on it. And then in back were like 10 business leaders. And when the when my agent called me and told me about this job and how much it was paying, I know I sound very materialistic. I keep saying how much it paid, but I was so excited. And then the art director said, well, each person that you draw has approval. They've got to approve it. And I went, this is going to be a nightmare. It's going to be a nightmare. <laughs> and it turned out to be the opposite. The only, per and I have to say his name. It was President, uh, he was just Trump then. Oh, I thought, I thought you meant Calvin Coolidge. <laughs> well, he was, yes, he wasn't such a bad guy. But um, he approved his, all of these people. And Warren Buffett wanted to smile. I changed that to a smile. And another one didn't like the tie pattern. And that was, I was just amazed that that happened because they were caricatures. You think these people are going to, you know, really give me a hard time. Instead, they liked it is what you're saying. They approved it. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. I, I think that that's probably understandable that when people, sometimes when people in the public eye are mocked, people mm. doing impressions of them or caricatures, like you're saying, they mm -hmm. actually like it. I think so. It makes them uh, famous or that they, they have to be special to have a caricature published of them, I think. Well, it's also a form of flattery. You're flattering them by the fact that you're drawing them. It's not just a photo that somebody took on the street. You're actually spending time and making it look unusual in some way. I want to tell you about something that happened several years ago that really floored me. Well, one of them was the journal started using my caricatures for the obituaries. Like when a famous person would die and I would draw them. And it was like, why are they doing this? And this is the Wall Street Journal. But they loved it. It went it went on for uh, several years, about two or three years. And I used to sit by the radio or listen to the TV for some famous person to die. And I would run in and draw a quick drawing and send it over. And they'd say, we'll take it. We'll take it. We'll take wow. it. And then I thought, this is great. But then when the Pope died, I thought, 
oh, that's they're not going to ask me to do a caricature of the Pope. And they did. <laughs> oh, boy, I'm going to be in so much trouble. But it was a, it's a very delicate caricature. And uh, but the thing that I wanted to tell you that connected to that is I have been commissioned by private people to draw loved ones that have passed away. Oh, and it's very touching to me. At first, I thought, well, that that doesn't sound quite right. But what you said earlier about capturing the essence, I think they wanted that in a different form. And I've had two people that I knew in person, and I drew them like quick sketches and so forth. And when they passed away, they used the drawing on the cover of the memorial program. And again, I was just floored by that. So it, it just always shocks me. But well, I'm going to go back to what I said much earlier, which is I think that part of that is because your drawings, I don't, I don't know of a single drawing of yours I've ever looked at in which the person was disrespected or was made fun of. You capture the way a person looks only exaggerated as caricature does, and you do it in a way that makes them look full of life and energy and, and fun, not like you're making fun of them. Right. And I think that's why people want to hire you to do a picture of someone in memoriam. Right. Well, that's good. It makes me feel good. So I asked you what your easiest challenge was. I'm wondering if you can say the opposite. What uh, picture did you draw where it was like, I can't figure this out. I can't figure it out. And it took you a while to get it. There have been a lot of those. <laughs> right? But I always, always come through. I um, somehow like what I told you, I would try different things or I'd get up and walk away from the drawing. Is it wind up being sheer brute force where you just sit down and because you're under deadline, you have to draw it? It's almost like that. But I do get up and walk around or watch television or something. And it relaxes me enough that I can go back and I start over and it's like a completely different drawing. And it's usually that's the one that works. And I don't know how that comes about, but it just happens. Not all the time, but. So you you started out wanting to be an actor, which means you wanted people to know who you were. You wanted people to see your physical being performing yes. on a stage. And now your work, who you are, is represented by drawings of others. Right. Do you right. ever consider, does it ever bother you in any way that millions of people have seen, know, and admire your work, but may not know who you are? Well, I'm sort of private in a way, and I've always thought that the work should just stand out. But I've been told by other people that I should promote my personality, my private life, whatever. And um, so I to answer your question, it, no, that doesn't bother me. I think in my mind, because like the Wall Street Journal has a publication of over 2 million, the, the actual paper, and I think all those people, even if they glance at it for two seconds they're seeing something that i created so for it, sure for sure it's a it's a very nice feeling and they all represent all those works of art represent you anyway right right i mean they do and and you've done enough of them where i'm quite confident that many people recognize oh it's that artist they may not even know your name but they right. you know it's that person is doing this drawing and they know that it's going to come out in a way that they're going to enjoy looking at I, I think that's an absolute inevitability with what you do. I am curious, drawing is a physical act. You have to use your body, your arm, and so on. Do you stay in shape some way? Do you have to work with your muscles in order to stay in shape? Or is that just not anything that you worry about? Yeah, my cardiologist said, what do you do for exercise? I walk the dog. And uh, he said, well, you're going to have to walk by yourself because the dog stops every you know, third tree. But that's basically all the exercise that I do, and I don't really... Um, so you, only... don't you don't have shoulder problems, you don't have elbow problems or anything like that? No, I'm very lucky, I guess. Um, I've never had that. Sometimes my hands are hurt a little bit, and I'm concerned about that, but it's nothing drastic. Mm -hmm. So I'm also curious, do you know when a drawing is finished? What tells you I'm done? Is it just time, or is there <laughs> something else? Well, sometimes I just feel like nothing else can be done to make it any better. Because when you do work for publications and so forth, you really have to do that. And, and especially ads, when you do uh, ad illustration, you, you have to make the client happy. So sometimes you're a little frustrated. But I had, again, going back to the American Express, I did a, a 
holiday uh, ad campaign for them, and there were four drawings, and they were full-page ads in all the major newspapers across the country. So it was holiday. They said, but it can't be Christmas. It just has to be holiday. So I drew this woman, and she's wearing an upside-down Christmas tree. I just thought I'd try to get away with it. And her purse was also an upside-down Christmas tree. Well, <laughs> they never caught that. But when I turned it in, they kept making changes, all of these changes. And I'm thinking, all right with me. You know, they're paying me all this money, and I'm doing these changes. We, they ended up going back to the original drawing. And it was never mentioned that there was a Christmas tree, two Christmas trees in that drawing. Wow. that's <laughs> So you've seen iterations of that where the work goes out, it comes back, they need a change or two, it comes back, it needs another change or two. How often does that happen where it's multiple changes? It doesn't happen that often, uh, especially with private commissions and so forth. But when you're dealing with ad agencies, they have all these people that have to earn their living. And so they think they have to say something, they have to make a change and so forth. But it's like not, working for a studio. Yes. Yes. I wanted to mention something about a year ago. I started getting complaints about my drawings from the woke people or whoever it is that, uh, that does this. And I had never had that problem before. And they were complaining about the smallest thing, like the, uh, the size of the bust, which I've never really, you know, it, things like that. And you, you're making them ugly. And these are people that you don't know who it is, but they're, they're sending their complaints to the editor of the publication. And it was very frustrating because I said to myself, I'm not going to be able to sit down and draw to please these people. First of all, it won't be caricature and it won't be what I'm drawing. And I started sending um, the drawings to Broadway World. That was where this was coming from. And I would say, this is the drawing. If you want to publish it, fine. I'm giving you first right of refusal. And they did that for a while. And then I guess it just got so crazy. They said, we just can't. They were afraid of being, of the sponsors getting letters. It was, it was crazy. And I thought, you know, if Hirschfeld were alive today, there would be a problem with his with his drawings, believe it or not. Not I mean, You and I do not find them offensive, but people find they're offended by all kinds of things. This is an actual problem in the arts today in general. It doesn't matter which form of the arts it is because people, individuals complain or even small groups complain and everybody else has to step back in lieu of these few people. And yes. I have nothing but admiration for someone that has a problem and expresses it, but they shouldn't be allowed to stop everybody else from enjoying stuff. Exactly. Exactly. That's just, it's like freedom of the press in a way. But the people that own the publications or the websites are afraid, if they have sponsors, they just, they fear that the sponsors will pull out. And uh, it is a shame of what is going on right now. And I think it, the pendulum will swing back the other way eventually. But it's really challenging right now for almost anybody in the arts because you only have to make one calculated mistake that's necessary to tell your tale or whatever it is you're doing right. and suddenly you're persona non grata and that's no good exactly. i'm very <laughs> lucky though i found a, a site called Times square chronicles and the lady that runs that adores me <laughs> and she she's given me such coverage and doesn't complain about anything so I don't know how long that will last. I don't know if she'll start getting complaints, but right now I'm I'm back on track and drawing the way that I want to. So what do you need around you to work? Aside from your drawing board and your ink and your pens and your paper and so on and the photos you need and Alfie. And Alfie. And Alfie, you got to have Alfie. Oh. What do you have in your office that you need to have around you to work? What inspires you in your office? Well, I actually have a lot of books on uh, of different caricature artists. And sometimes just looking at somebody else's work inspires me. And so I have a lot of those. And I actually have three original Hirschfelds hanging in my studio. Wow. And uh, that- I, I, I have one. Yes? I yes. have one for Jekyll and Hyde. I've got the Jekyll and Hyde oh, Hirschfeld. Oh, okay. Well, 
it's very exciting to just some to have the real and do you know the artist david levine who's a political artist he he, he was famous for the big heads, small bodies, and the cross hatching. Oh, he, sure. I do know who you mean. Yes. Yes. Well, I got to know him just before he died, and I always loved his work. I could never seem to draw like that or to get cross hatching as well as he did it. And on eBay, I found a drawing of his where I think it was $90. And they sell for, you know, the thousands and so forth. So, of course, I jumped on it, and I have that also in my studio. And it just makes me feel good to look around and see other artists' work. And, um, and, and who else do you admire? Who else do you look at and you get you take inspiration from? There's an artist, Robert Risco, that started out about the same time that I did, and uh, he's very good. Totally different styles. I like the old, the old artist. Aubrey Beardsley, do you know? You remember? I absolutely know Aubrey Beardsley for sure. I got to see they had an exhibit at Harvard of his work, and I was just gobsmacked by it because, for one thing, they were small drawings, and his work was so detailed. And he must have used a pen that was like a hair or something. And I, you look at it and you think, how did he do this? It's just unbelievable. That was very exciting to see those. Uh, those drawings are you a fan of gory oh the uh that did the new yorker cartoons he Is did the him? new yorker cartoons yes he's very very yes his work was very individual um totally very unique i met charles adams because when i was taking that course in cartooning our teacher was a, in fact a new yorker cartoonist and he every week he would bring in a cartoonist from the new yorker and we got to meet like ed booth all of these great great people and our assignment every week we had to do 12 cartoons and send them off to the new yorker and we had to prove it by bringing in our re rejection ticket it's <laughs> so uh, but i really enjoyed that whole um experience of taking the well, well what kind of confidence were they instilling to assume that you were going to be rejected <laughs> well it was one of those, this is the way it is in life. And a lot of the best cartoonists started out, and it was years before they got a nibble. For sure. And it's that's kind of scary, but... There aren't too many people in the performing arts or anywhere else that instantly are hits. It usually no. takes time and energy and a lot of patience and perseverance. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm... I have to admit, sometimes I'm easily discouraged, but fortunately, I haven't had too much of that. And um, yeah, that's why I, I really had to get out of acting. I couldn't take the rejection. It was just, just really, you know, hit me. And, and as an actor, they're not rejecting your work. They're rejecting you. That's right. You, it's really you know, difficult. And I don't have that trouble with, with illustration, with showing my work. You're able to separate yourself from your work? Yes. Even though it represents you, it's not you? Right. At, at my exhibit, I've overheard some people say, well, that doesn't really look like them or whatever. It just goes over. I, you're right. It's not me. It's the work. So it's still think. someone else's opinion, but it's not about you personally. It's right. about something that you did, because I've had plenty of that as a writer where right. you, get, you get rejected or somebody wants to change the whole thing or whatever it is. And you learn not to take it personally. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, so if you could go back in time and do one thing over to achieve a more satisfying result, what might that be? Hmm. Well, I was thinking that some of the Forbidden Broadway things could have been better in the early years. Because um, you were learning your way at that yeah, time. That's right. That's right. But there was a period for seven years, the first poster in Schubert Alley on the 45th Street side as you entered was a Forbidden Broadway poster, which they changed at least twice a year. And it was fabulous. Every time I would go to Schubert Alley, and sometimes I'd see Japanese tourists taking pictures, and I would pose them in front of the poster and, and take their picture. Such an ego trip. But, <laughs> but then I would look at some of the figures, and I would think, ah, you should have worked harder on that. That's, that's really about it. Nothing. So generally speaking, you're pleased with the way that your career has progressed and the art has progressed. Yes, I think I'm very lucky with the timing. 
I could have started a little earlier, but I did get on the tail end of a, a very exciting period where illustration was, was really being used. And there were a lot of great ones. There's still great ones, but there's just not enough work. I'm really happy that I got to experience that. I mean, the big time, you know, the ad agencies, big money, that, all that sort of thing. I am having problem. the most wonderful conversation and so much fun with Ken Fallon. And I'm just wondering, you've obviously been around a while and you've met lots of people and you've had lots of experiences. Do you have an oddball, weird, quirky, offbeat, or just plain funny story you can share with us beyond the ones you've already told us? I do. I wanted to tell you, not that I'm trying to get sympathy here, but my parents never understood me. They were wonderful parents. I had a fabulous childhood, but they did not understand definitely acting. When I became an illustrator, my father, who was always in sales, couldn't understand that people were paying me to draw. That was like a child thing or something. And he never commented. But I found out later, they lived in a small town in Georgia, that he would get the paper and show it around to people and brag and say, this is my son. He never said that to me. Never said that to me. Except I, there's a happy ending in that just before he died, we had a very good closure. And he told me he was proud of me. Oh. But never understood me. But I can understand that. I, I was like almost from Mars in that part of the country. I was such a strange person, an artist, a, an actor. The story I want to tell you, um, I was at a party in New York. I was living in Boston. I was at a party in New York. And Liza Minnelli came in. And I had met her manager before on something else. So I got to be friendly with her and we were talking. And I said, Liza, I own an original Hirschfeld of you as Little Red Riding Hood and a TV musical that was done like in 65 called The Dangerous Christmas of Little Red Riding Hood. And Cyril Richard was the big bad wolf. Now, this drawing is fabulous. That was my first purchase. And she said, you know, I've never seen it. And she and I said, well, gee, I would show you mine, but it's in Boston. She said, you know what? I'm going to be in Boston in a couple of weeks doing a concert. Could you come to the concert as my guest and bring the drawing? Well, the drawing is about the size of a, a window. It's big and it's in a big, heavy frame. But I thought, OK, so we took it and we were able to leave it backstage and then go watch the concert. And she was fabulous. She was just so great and gave it everything. And then afterwards, she came back to her dressing room and they took us into the dressing room and I had my my drawing and I had it, had it covered up. But I had also done a drawing of her for the Boston Herald to announce that, you know, she was coming in to do this concert. So I thought, I'll show mine first. So she's all excited and she comes over and I say, well, Liza, this is the drawing I did of you. And I ripped the paper off and she goes, oh, <laughs> you know, this is terrible. I'll show her the Hirschfeld. That'll make everything right. So I took the cover off of the Hirschfeld and she turned and put her head in her boyfriend's chest and she's moaning and he's trying to tell her, oh, honey, you don't look like that. You know, you're much prettier than that. It's a very extreme caricature. But anyway, I found out later she doesn't like to have people imitate her, you know, people that do impressions of her. And she does not like caricature. There I was in the dressing room with Stanley and feeling terrible. So we decided we'd sneak out, you know, goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. And the backstage door at this was at Symphony Hall in Boston is a double door and they had a guard on each side and they would open it out so that the person could come out. And we could hear when we were in the dressing room, a crowd was gathering and it was getting bigger and bigger. So when we're, I'm taking the drawing and everything and I'm standing by the door and the guard says, tell us when you're ready. And so I said, I'm ready. I, why not? And they swing the doors open. And the crowd thought it was Liza. And they're going, whoa! <laughs> we had to walk the length of this thing with these people giving us dirty looks. <laughs> that, I'm telling you, that was such an experience. But that that's the thing that happened. Did you ever see her again? Yes. As a matter of fact, a friend of mine did a nightclub act with her just for one night only in New York. I redrew her and I made it as nice as I could. And I took it along with me. And when the show was over, uh, she came out. She was actually in a wheelchair. She had 
hurt her hip or something. And I went over to her and I showed it to her and she smiled and thanked me. And that was it. So I did see her. We're not close or anything. But, uh, no, but, but people are sometimes sensitive to those things. And she obviously uh, is sensitive to that. And you know who else is? It, this will really shock you. Carol Burnett. Sensitive to her pictures? Car car yeah, caricature. Because I was hired to replace an ad for a Broadway show called Moon Over Buffalo. And the original poster was a buffalo with a moon over it. So they thought that was, you know, they weren't selling tickets. So I was called in and I brought a sketch that I did of Carol Burnett and, and the other actor that was in it. And they all loved it. It was, I felt I was riding on a cloud that day. I mean, all these really picky art directors and the producer of the play was there. And they said, oh, this is fabulous. This is fabulous. They even, they, she called me later, the producer, and said, oh, can't wait to show Carol. This is just so great. It's going to really make a difference. The next morning, I got a call, and she said, Ken, Carol doesn't like the drawing, so we can't go with it. We can't go with it. So I thought, oh, well, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that was going to be my Broadway debut, but it was fine. It have was you fine. have you had drawings on uh, Playbills on Broadway? Uh, not on the cover. On off Broadway, I've had some covers from Playbook. I've had inside illustrations, but I've never done a cover yet. I'd love to, love to do a Broadway poster. That that's a dream. Well, you know, uh, I'm sure you know Frank Verlizzo, Fravor. And oh, lovely man! I like him so much. He's been a guest on this show, and yes. uh, his work is uniquely his as well. Absolutely. And you can almost tell, a, although his is less distinct than yours, because he has to be more sort of fluid with the different styles of different shows. Wow. But his style is, it's a Fravor style. And, uh, but he's been on lots of Playbill covers, obviously. That's what he Yes, sort of yes, because he does the- uh, He's the a logo. poster, he's a poster designer. I mean, that's what yes, he does. Yes, yes. We talked about his Lion King, that he did that. And they bought it out for a huge amount of money. Because normally that doesn't happen, they because they wanted it forever, and uh, he said it was enough money; it didn't matter. But that's that logo has just been all over the world. Oh, everywhere, sure. So sure. great for me personally. His greatest work is the uh, Sunday in the Park with George poster with the two with the you yes. know it looks like it's torn paper. So clever, yeah. very clever, very very clever. Yeah, all right, so last question for you today, Ken. You've given us tons of thoughts and advice as we've gone along the way here, but I'm, I'm wondering if you have a solid piece of advice or a tip that you like to give to those who are just starting out in the business, or maybe they're in a little bit and trying to figure out how to get to the next level. And they want to be an illustrator and particularly sure. a sure. sure, or or even people that want to be in the business in some way, either way. Okay, well, it's changed tremendously. And I would say learn to work on the computer. Not only it's the future, it's today. And you'll probably work, but print publications are just dying out and there's just very little. So if you if your heart is set on that, it's going to be a disappointment. And also newspapers, that's where I started out. And uh, I'm still sad, but I look at history and things were always changing. Nothing ever stays still. So that I would just learn all the techniques and you'll, you'll be fine. And, you know, just keep going, keep doing it. And if you believe in yourself, you'll get there, you'll make it. Well, that is uh, absolutely true to the heart advice, because if you, no one ever succeeds by giving up. So you have to keep at it. Ken Fallon, this has been just so much fun for me. And I'm thoroughly delighted that you uh, have spent some time with me today on Storybeat. And I can't thank you enough. Oh, thank you so much, Steve. I've enjoyed myself tremendously. It's been a lot of fun for me. It's very, it's a nice ego thing to talk about yourself. So thank you for inviting me. And so we've come to the end of today's Story Beat. If you like this episode, won't you please take a moment to give us a comment, rating, or review on whatever app or platform you're listening to. Your support helps us bring more great Story Beat episodes to you. Storybeat is available on all major podcast apps and platforms, including Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, TuneIn, and many others. Until next time, I'm Steve Cuden, and may all your stories be unforgettable.